Nathan comes to us to do a PhD here, um, with co-supervised uh, by myself and Martin, uh, after about 15 years of um, experience in the solar cell manufacturing industry. Um, and it's uh, timely, I think, to bring the expertise he's got in manufacturing uh, to research at UNSW. We've seen solar become increasingly competitive uh, um, with conventional e electricity generation. Um, that's exciting because it opens up all sorts of new markets and increases awareness. But still, uh, solar generation is only 2% of worldwide electricity generation, so there's still a big opportunity. But it focuses our mind on the cost of uh, the technologies we're developing. So, and it requires us to be more aware of other markets and competition. Uh, so Nathan's working in a new area of research known as techno-economic analysis. It's what we used to call manufacturing costing, but techno-economic analysis sounds a lot smarter. Um, he's building models to help us understand how to price emerging energy technologies, both the evolutionary ones, so small changes on the silicon technologies, and revolutionary ones, uh, like the new materials technologies. So I'll hand over now to Nathan to tell us where he is with his techno-economic analysis. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Renata. Um, before I jump into the main part of the talk, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on my past experience in cost analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, as Renata mentioned, I have spent more than 15 years working in solar, um, in R&D and in manufacturing, and um, in a number of different roles. But uh, a common strand throughout all the, of that time uh, has been a focus on cost analysis. And when I think back on, on this, these years, uh, the, the nature and the emphasis of the cost analysis actually changed over time. So in the early days, for example, when the technology that we're working on, which is a thin film silicon technology, uh, was very immature, the efficiencies were low, uh, the process wasn't well understood, we didn't really know exactly what we were going to do, uh, but we still did manufacturing cost analysis. We still did it. Uh, it wasn't a huge resource put against it, but we did it. And the, the main reason for doing it, and the main emphasis, was to guide the research, to, to see where the issues were so that in the lab we could solve those problems. So, for example, if we worked out that it needed 10 lasers to do a particular process and that was, that was too many, uh, the people in the lab could then focus and, and try and find a solution and maybe we can reduce it to only one laser. And so, in doing this, we were able to, to make faster improvements towards commercialization. Uh, then as, as the, the process matured and the technology matured and the efficiencies got higher, we got to the stage where it was getting really close to when we could actually go into manufacturing. And at that point, we s still did cost analysis, but it was a, of a different nature. We were now trying to convince ourselves and our investors that it was a good idea uh, to implement this in manufacturing. And so it was a lot more detailed, a lot more people were involved. Almost everyone in the company, every technical person was involved in some way in this cost analysis. And, um, and there was a lot at stake. There was a lot of investment required to go to the next stage and we wanted to make sure that it was the right decision. Then, as it happened, we did go into manufacturing. We set up a, a factory in Germany. And once it was running, we still did cost analysis. But again, it was a different nature. Uh, it wasn't um, the same as before. Now it was focusing on incremental changes. Was it a good idea to, to make this change? What would be the benefits? What would be the costs? And what would be the risk? And how long would it take to pay back our investment? So with that perspective and what I've learned and how I've seen cost, um, cost analysis and the, its importance, um, it's influenced me greatly in, in how, I, how I view cost analysis and why we might want to do it. So many of us in this room are investigating various aspects of photovoltaics, different technologies, and when we think about our technology that we're working on, often one of the questions in our minds is, could this be commercially viable? Could this be um, deployed at a high volume and, and spread throughout the world? Can it make a big difference um, in this world? And so cost analysis can be very helpful in that. Firstly, it can tell us where we are now. If we take our technology as it stands, what we're doing in the lab, if we were to try and manufacture it and get the same performance, where would we, where would we be? Where would the cost be low enough? Would the performance be high enough? 
would we cross the line and become co commercially viable? Now, for most of us, probably not yet because we're still working on it. Uh, but it allows, to see, it allows us to see where we are. Another thing that's useful to know is, well, what happens if we actually achieve everything we're, we're trying to achieve with our technology? What if we reach all our milestones? What if um, we get there? Then where will we be? The performance will be better, the cost will be lower. Will it cross the threshold? Will it become commercially viable? And a third thing we can see and learn from this analysis is what are the barriers that are stopping us from getting from where we are now to where we want to be? And not just what are the barriers, but what are the most important barriers that we should focus on uh, and, and solve uh, and in what priority? Because we want to get to being commercially viable as quickly as possible. So cost analysis is important. It is helpful and I've seen that and I've experienced that and I hope you'll agree. But it is also difficult. The cost calculations themselves are actually very straightforward. But the difficulty is in getting the data getting accurate data. And there are many reasons for this. Firstly, there are technical reasons. What process are we actually going to use? What equipment are we going to use to actually uh, implement this process in high volume production? What materials and, and what kind of wastage might we get? Uh, and what's, what's the performance going to be? But there are also cost related uncertainties. How much is it going to cost for this equipment to, to implement this process? Maybe no one's ever made an, a piece of equipment that does this. Well, how, how are we going to estimate the cost? Or maybe they do know how to make it, but how much is it going to cost to build 10 or 100 of these for high volume production? And what about materials? One gram costs this much, but how much does a, a ton? And then there are market uncertainties. How much is the market going to value the modules that we produce? Um, what's the selling price going to be? And how are they going to value certain special features of our technology? whether it's higher power or lightweight or it looks better. So for all these reasons, it, it's quite difficult to, to complete a cost analysis. And what I want to do is explain uh, in two parts the cost analysis and then illustrate it also in two parts with two examples. And at its heart, it's a, a Monte Carlo analysis. And I'm going to explain what that means in a moment. So underlying this method is uh, I guess an assumption that it is much easier to estimate a range for any one parameter than it is to estimate one accurate number. Here we've got a few different um, parameters that we would need to know in order to calculate the cost of this process. This happens to be a PECVD process. It's not including the materials at this stage, just the, the processing cost from the equipment. And for example, we need to know how much the tool will cost. But to actually know exactly how much a tool would cost at a particular throughput for a factory is actually really hard. However, it's not so hard to work out a range. And for every parameter, it's going to be a different range. And so if something that we really have no idea about, then we're going to put a really large range on that. And that's much easier to do than to try and find accurately one number because that can take a lot of effort. And there are so many parameters that we'd have to find. So we can do this with every parameter. We, we choose a nominal number, which is our best estimate of, of that parameter. We choose a low and a high, and that gives us the range. And we do that for each of the parameters of interest. And what we want to do is somehow put them all together and work out, well, what is the cost going to be and what's the uncertainty in our cost for this process? So how can we combine them? Well, we can multiply all the nom well, use all the nominal values and get a number. And that's what generally we do with cost analysis. We just pick the best number and, and calculate it. Uh, but that doesn't give us the indication of what happens with the uncertainty. We could take all the worst values of all, in all cases and calculate a number, and all the best values and calculate another number, and that would give us a big range. But that's never going to happen. Are you going to really have the worst possible case of every situation? And so that's where the Monte Carlo analysis comes in. And what we do with this Monte Carlo analysis is we take each parameter, we take the three values that we've selected, and we use them to generate a number of scenarios or iterations. In this case, we've got 5,000 iterations. You can see the iteration number down here. And for each iteration, we choose a number and it's, uh, it's chosen randomly, but based on a distribution. So in this case, it's a 
half log normal distribution. And we make this distribution su such that the median will become the nominal and the low and the high will become the 10th and the 90th percentile values. I've got some formulas there in case you want to uh, do it yourself. Um, and this is what you get. So if we were to look at these 5,000 generated numbers and look at the distribution of those on, on this histogram, we would see something that resembles a normal distribution. Most of the data points are close to the median. Um, some of them are a bit higher or lower, but not as many. And some of them even go beyond our low value and our high value. Once we've done that, we can do the same for every single parameter. And it's important to note that we do these all independently. So for iteration zero, maybe the tool cost is particularly high in that distribution, but the downtime is particularly low and something else is in the middle. Once we've generated all these data, all these values, we now have 5,000 scenarios where we can calculate the cost. We do need a few other assumptions and we can use some um, uh, overall global assumptions about, for example, how much does electricity cost? Uh, how much does labour cost? How many years are we going to depreciate the, the capital cost over? But once we have those assumptions and we have those generated data, we can very easily calculate the total cost. And we end up with 5,000 total cost values. Remember, this is just for this one process. And we can look at the distribution of those calculated cost uh, iterations and show them on a histogram. And from that, we can extract parameters. What was the median cost? What's the 10th, what's the 90th percentile? And then from that, we can calculate this metric of normalised uncertainty. What's the, uh, the difference between the 10th and 90th percentile divided by the median? And this gives us an indication of how uncertain this particular calculation is. Once we've done that for one process, we repeat for every process and every material item. And so you can see in this particular case, they're more listed there. We do two things with this. Firstly, horizontally, for every iteration, we can add all the, all the costs uh, calculated for every process and every material to give a total cell cost at the right-hand side. Vertically, we can also look at each particular component and calculate the nominal and the normalised uncertainty, and we'll use that later. But first, I just want to show you the distribution of the total cost uh, of this sequence. What we've essentially done is taken the uncertainty in every single of those underlying parameters, varied them and put them together to have a picture for what is the total cost and how uncertain is, the, is that total cost. And um, then we can use these to compare and, um, and understand what's happening. So that's the method, that's the Monte Carlo method. Now I want to illustrate its usefulness with an example. So the first example that I'm looking at is uh, a technology that's in quite early development. Uh, the perovskite on glass technology, or perovskite solar cell technology, has, um, is quite a hot topic in photovoltaics at the moment. It's seen massive improvements in the uh, efficiency over just a short number of years. Uh, the materials used in the absorber layer are potentially very low cost to, uh, to, to produce and, and to, to manufacture. Uh, it does have some issues. Uh, it hasn't yet been scaled up at high efficiency to large areas and there's also uh, problems with the durability. But even at this early stage, it's worth looking at the, the manufacturing costs and seeing what we can learn. So this particular analysis was done about one and a half years ago and at the time, uh, this module uh, was the largest module that had been produced. Uh, um, it, was, it was done by an Italian group, CHOSE, and here you can see the structure and also a few of the, the key process steps. I'm not going to explain this in detail, just want you to know it's a fairly standard perovskite uh, structure that's been scaled up. From this, we knew all the process steps, looked at various publications, got cost data from various other photovoltaics um, papers and public and, and data sources and um, worked out all those uncertainties for every process and for every material and put them through the, the model, the Monte Carlo analysis. And here's the result. 
So this is sequence A, the uh, demonstrated sequence, and the total cost of manufacture of the complete module that could be put on someone's roof. So I've put there for reference the cost of a uh, crystalline silicon module these days. This is the, um, the wholesale price, and that's at about $70 per square metre. So you can see that the cost estimate here is very, very high and also very uncertain. But there's no need to panic. <laughs> this is not the death of this technology. <laughs> um, we have very purposefully chosen to analyse the technology as it stands, rather than saying, oh, let's just assume that we're not going to use all these things. Let's assume we can do this with no wastage. And, oh, wow, look, uh, this is so cheap. That's not the approach. Rather, we've taken, what, taken where we are right now, analysed that, in order to identify what are the issues? And then the researchers can focus on them and, and see what's the most important to solve and, and work in solving them. And that way we can get towards commercialization as quickly as possible. So what is the dominant cost why, uh, or costs? Why is the cost so high? So if you were studying the, the structure, you might have noticed there's gold in there. And um, it's not surprising perhaps that in fact, when you look at the median uh, median cost of each component and, and, and graph them, gold is way off the charts. And that is the dominant reason for this high cost. So very clearly, we need to get rid of the, the gold and replace it with something else. So we could end it there. We could tell the researchers, all right, solve gold, come back when you're finished, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll run the analysis again. Uh, but actually, rather than do that, it's worth looking a little bit more deeply and seeing, well, w what happens if we could solve the gold problem? What else could be lying underneath the surface? So to do that, we looked at sequence B. And in this case, the only change was replacing the gold with silver. Now, this is technically feasible. The pro it's compatible with the processes that were done. There are some problems with silver, which is why most people tend to use gold that potentially can cause faster degradation, for example. And there are also other alternatives that people are looking at. For example, carbon nanotubes. Uh, this particular change was, um, didn't in, was very, it's, it's something that could be done uh, as the only change to the process and we could still complete the analysis. Some of the other methods would require a complete restructure of the process. So for this particular study, this is what we looked at. And you can see, our cost has reduced and the uncertainty has reduced as well. It's still a little bit more than our crystalline silicon modules, uh, but we've only done you know, kind of one thing, so <laughs> there's still room for improvement. And now it's worth looking more closely at what are the cost drivers and what are the most important. And here we come to the normalised cost uncertainty graph. It's no longer just one thing that's dominant. And so by arranging the different cost components in this way, with on the x-axis we have the median cost, and on the y-axis we have the normalised uncertainty. And arranging it in this way actually helps us to categorise the different components in different ways and helps us to think of how to deal with them. Something in the bottom left is we think low cost, and actually the uncertainty is pretty low. We're, we're pretty sure this is a low cost component. And for example, the junction box, that's the box on the back of the module where you do the electrical, connect electrical connections. It's a low cost and we know it's low cost, so we can ignore it, at least for now. Next in this area, we've got items that are, we believe, low cost, but there is actually quite some uncertainty about that. So for example, the lead iodide. We don't know exactly how much we're going to waste with, with this particular process. We don't know how much it's going to cost it for tons of this at this particular purity level. Uh, so there is a lot of uncertainty and it would be sensible to understand that better, maybe um, do some work on that uh, to reduce that uncertainty. But at this stage, it's low priority. There are other things that are more important. In this area, we have costs that are, we believe, high and actu actually, yeah, we're pretty sure they are high. So what can we do? Well, we can either live with it, just accept that it's a high cost, or we can try to replace it with an alternative. And finally, in some ways the most interesting section of this graph is the, where we've got a, a high median cost, a high expected cost, but also high cost uncertainty. So sure, we can try and replace those high cost items, 
But also, it may be worth doing a more detailed study, spending some resources, uh, talking to people, doing a, a feasibility study to try and work out, are these costs really going to be that high? Or are they going to be worse? Or are they going to be better? And then once we know that, we will know better how to deal with them. So hopefully from that little example, you can see some of the usefulness of this technique and how it can help us uh, and guide our research. I want to leave it there. This particular study has been published, so I've got, there's more to this analysis that you can read up uh, if you are interested. But I want to move on uh, and talk a little bit more about an uh, enhancement to the method. You probably would have noticed, a lot of you would have noticed, that during that first example, I didn't actually talk too much about the efficiency. Normally when we talk about cost for photovoltaics, we talk about dollars per watt, not dollars per square metre because the efficiency of the module makes a big difference. And um, so actually I think for, for technologies that are very early in development, it actually makes sense to do it that way, to look at the per square metre cost and look at the cost drivers and separately, I mean not ignore, nor efficiency obviously, but treat it kind of separately, consider it separately and that can actually help, help us. But for technologies that are very close to commercialization or are an incremental improvement to a commercialized technology, uh, they the efficiency and the cost, they all interrelate a lot and we really need to consider them together in the Monte Carlo analysis. But not just the efficiency, we also need to look at the market uh, and the market value of our, of our product. Uh, there are, uh, for example, um, it, it's not just about having the lowest cost, the lowest dollars per watt, because it's, that's not the only thing that's valued in the market. So for example, if you have a higher power module, uh, you will generally get a higher price, uh, a selling price in dollars per watt for that. And if you expect something to last longer or, or have you know, reduced degradation, you would expect to get a higher price. Or there may be some other features that are valued in the market. So in describing the, these enhancements to, to, the, um, to the method, I want to do it at the same time as uh, go going through the second example. And in this case, it is looking at various improvements to crystalline silicon commercialised technologies. So very briefly, some of the technologies we're looking at. Uh, a, our, our first baseline is the aluminium back surface field technology. This is if you like the, the old standard um, in commercial production. Uh, it's got aluminium on the rear which forms this back surface field, that's why it's called aluminium back surface field. And the industry as a whole is moving towards sequence B which is a PERC technology. And in essentially it's an improvement to the rear of the cell. So we add some processes and add some cost to the rear side of the cell in order to improve the efficiency. Another technology we're looking at is LDSE, laser doped selective emitter. This is a technology that has been developed here at the University of New South Wales uh, and it was commercialised by Suntec in the Pluto technology. And when you look at that here, it's the, the rear is actually the same as the aluminium back surface field but the front of the cell has been improved and that also improves the efficiency. Now the way I've arranged it, there's actually a little gap in the bottom right hand corner and, um, and so this is actually the, the, the particular process of interest in this study. Since the PERC improves the rear and the LDSC improves the front, why don't we put them together? Is that a good idea? Is that worth doing? Uh, should we investigate this and research this and, and try and put this into production eventually? So it will be a higher cost, uh, but it should achieve a higher efficiency. And um, we estimate um, that there is a potential to get up to 1% efficiency boost uh, on the cell level. So I'm going to, so uh, yes, so this is some of the data sources um, used for this study. Um, uh, we can go back to this if needed during the questions. Uh, so I want to, as I said, explain a little bit more about the um, some, some changes and improvements to the, uh, the, the methodology um, while exploring this particular example. And the first part I want to explain is the use of simultaneous Monte Carlo analysis. 
what we have here are the two sequences of interest, B and D. B on the top, D on the, on the, on the bottom. And we have all the different process steps and all the material items. And on the right, we've summed the total cost per square metre. This is of producing a cell. And we can look at those two distributions, the cost, total cost of manufacture, and plot them on the same histogram. And we can see here that sequence D is more expensive per square metre on average. Um, but the curves kind of overlap a little bit. But the use of simultaneous Monte Carlo analysis allows us to see the difference between these more easily. So what is this thing? Wh what are we talking about? Well, when we look at these two process sequences, a lot of the processes are the same. They're common to both. Uh, you can see I've, I've linked them with the, the blue arrows there. And so what this means is when we look at, here's, a, here's one example of a um, process that's the same in both cases, the, the cost of the, the incoming p-type wafer. We're doing this uh, multicolor simulation simultaneously. So that means for iteration zero, that's the first uh, iteration, the cost of the p-type wafer is the same for process A as well as for process, sorry, for process B as for process D. And so for every iteration, it's the same for the two sequences. And for every process that's the same and, uh, and every material that's the same, uh, the iteration uh, calculated cost for that component is the same. And so what that means is that we can actually distinguish the differences between the processes more easily. And we can do this by looking at the difference. So I've actually added a column just on the right here, which is the cost of each iteration, the cost, calculated cost of each iteration compared to the cost of process B. And obviously for process B, that's always zero. Uh, but for process D, it's not. And we can now plot um, the distribution of those numbers on the same graph. So all the zeros are in blue here and they stack nicely on top of each other uh, and that's the, um, the baseline. And all in green we have the difference, the, in this case the additional cost per square, per square metre. Um, of and, and what we see is that in 100% of the iterations, in every single iteration, it was more expensive to produce process B. And so we can see that the difference very much more, qu more clearly. And so we'll use this as we continue in building up the model. So let's first look at module fabrication costs. In this case, we've focused on cell fabrication because that's where the process differences are. And here we have sequence B and sequence D, the cell cost in that first column. But to get to the market and, and to market effects, we need to work out the cost of, cost of a module. And in this case, because we're not really focusing on that, uh, we've, I've modelled in a fairly simple way. So firstly, I've applied a cell yield for each of the different sequences, and that varies because we're not, there's some uncertainty in what that's going to be. And also modelled a module conversion cost. That's the cost of putting the glass and the laminate, and uh, all those costs put together are going to be a certain dollars per module. Uh, but again, there's some uncertainty in that, and so that varies within the analysis. But when we put those two together, uh, along with the cell production cost, we'll end up with a module cost, for, and we can plot those. And when we look at the difference, uh, the difference graph on the bottom right corner, we can see that still the cost of um, sequence D uh, at the module level is more expensive per module, and that really makes sense. That's no surprise. But it is a higher power module. It's the cells should be higher efficiency. That's what we expect anyway. So we need to incorporate that. So here we've taken the cell module cost that we've calculated earlier, put it in the first column, and we need to now model the cell efficiency. Now, again, there's going to be some variation in that. So we've modelled that within the Monte Carlo analysis. And the way this is modelled is firstly there's variation in the um, sequence B cell efficiency, and then I've modelled a variable efficiency improvement from uh, adding LDSC. And um, when you put those together, you get these various efficiency numbers. Uh, then to make the module, there's going to be another efficiency conversion factor. You generally lose a bit of power 
as you, as you go from the cell to the module. So we apply that factor. Again, that's also got some uncertainty, so that, that varies as well. And we can therefore get the module cost in, um, sorry, the module power in watts. Since we know the cost in dollars per module, we know the power in watts, we can calculate the cost of the module in dollars per watt, and then we can graph that. And here we see again, unfortunately, still in 70% of the cases, our new sequence D is more expensive to produce uh, per watt. So even when we apply the improved efficiency, it's still more expensive. But uh, higher, higher power modules are more valuable in dollars per watt. So we really need to take this into account as well. And so we need to take into, into account mar the, uh, the market price and work out what's going to be the margin to the manufacturer. And that's going to be what determines uh, for the manufacturer if this is a, a good idea or not. So we've taken the module cost, we've got the module power, and then we need a couple more parameters to work out the selling price. What is the, the cost of a, of a module going to be in dollars per watt? Again, that's going to change. It does change. It fluctuates over time. Uh, but a second factor, what is the value of a higher power module? What is the power selling price premium uh, that we can achieve for a high, higher module? And that's also a bit uncertain. We don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we can include it in our uncertainty analysis. And we vary them, and we'll get a selling price per module. We have a module production cost per module. We have a selling price per module. We can subtract the two and work out the margin per module. And when we graph this, the great news is sequence D now looks better. For margin, we want a higher margin. That means more profits. So in this case, in, in over 90% of the iterations, uh, sequence D actually would deliver increased margin to the manufacturer. So that's good news. That's excellent news. We, um, we're seeing that this, this technology has promise. However, if you're going to invest in a new technology, if you're going to implement all these changes to your production line, it is a massive, massive investment. You have to pour millions and millions of dollars into it. You want to be sure that it's a good idea. Now here, it looks you know, reasonably convincing, but there are 10% of the iterations where it's still worse and quite a number where it's not that much better. It would be really nice to be able to reduce this, this uncertainty uh, and be really sure that this is a winner. So, how can we tell what's causing this to be so wide? Well, thinking back to our first example, we could look at our normalised uh, uncertainty graph. We could look at all the individual costs of each process and, and the see which one's most uncertain and, and all that. And yes, that is a good idea. So we can do that. So that's this first dot point. We can look at the process costs. Now, a lot of the processes are common, as I've, as I've mentioned. Um, and there are some changes. There are some additional processes for sequence D and some that are taken away. But that's not the full story. That's not, if you just looked at that in isolation, that is not going to explain this wide, vari this wide vari variation we have. Because there are other factors. What was the efficiency boost of the new process? Um, what is it actually going to be? That's going to make a huge difference to the margin. What about differences in cell yield? If one of them is, has really bad yield, well, that's going to that's make a big difference. How much is the module price actually going to be? What if it goes through the roof? Is that going to change which one's better? And, and what about the, the price premium? If, if we're going to expect higher module price, hi higher power modules to sell for even more, then the higher efficiency process is going to be preferred. So what we'd really want to do is have a look at all these parameters that could be contributing to this, this width and compare them and rank them somehow and see, well, which one is the most important? And then we know what to focus on. And we can. That's the next step in this uh, methodology. What we can do is uh, identify all the parameters that are going to affect uh, this variation, choose parameters in a very carefully, make sure they're, they're all independent of each other, and then do a linear regression. Work out what, how important is each one 
in affecting the change in this, in this margin. And once we get those coefficients, we can square them, and that becomes the contribution to our uncertainty. And when we do that, here's the result. In this particular analysis, the top, the top item, contributing 30% of that uh, uncertainty, is the efficiency difference. How much extra efficiency are we expecting to get from this sequence, for sequence D compared to sequence B? And in this case, it was modelled as a range, somewhere between 0.7 and 1% absolute. So because we have that uncertainty, that's causing 30% of our uncertainty in, in the... Um, so, th so this is a really important factor in our decision, whether this is worth pursuing. That probably didn't come as a, as a surprise. If you were to think about it, you probably would have come up with that, that answer anyway. But the next one I think is quite interesting, and it was a bit surprising to me anyway when I first did this analysis. So the, uh, the amount of uh, selling par price premium you would get from a higher power module, the I've had to estimate that based on some market information, and with that uncertainty range, that's actually almost as, as much uh, uncertainty in the answer as the efficiency gain. So actually, that's quite important. I, if we expect the um, higher power modules to be even really, really valuable in the future, well, that's, that's a bonus for this technology. But if we think that's going to shrink in the future and that people aren't going to care so much, well, maybe it's not, it's not going to be quite as good as we thought. Cell yield is going to be important, but it's only when we get to the fourth or fifth item that we actually start to look at the individual process costs. And in this case, it's the plating solutions and the, the paste. Here we've got, we're looking at the same effect, but in a slightly different way. These four graphs are each looking at the four top um, contributions to that uncertainty and seeing how they relate to the margin difference. So remember we have 5,000 iterations here. For each iteration, let, let's focus on this, uh, this top left one. For every iteration, we say, well, what was the efficiency difference in that particular iteration? And what was the margin difference in that particular iteration? And we plot that as a scatter plot. And what this shows us, kind of more intuitively, I think, is what's happening here. So when, <coughs> excuse me, in the cases where we have a, a very uh, large efficiency gain, our margin improvement tends to be higher. So that's in this area over here. However, in cases where uh, the efficiency gain isn't quite as high, well, actually, maybe we're not really getting in any margin improvement, or maybe we're even going backwards. And so what this is showing us is that um, this really is what we should be focusing on. Um, if we're working on this technology, if, 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 we wanna, if we want this to succeed and we're thinking, yeah, yeah, we, we want to convince people, then what we need to do is show that we're going to get high efficiency. So when you go in the lab and, and, and show, yeah, look, 1%, we've, we've got 1% or more. And that's really going to give this technology legs. It's going to convince people because they can see, wow, if, if, if you do get that improvement, that's going to give us a better margin. On the other hand, someone perhaps someone else looking at this might say, oh, I really don't think this is going to work. I, don't really, I think you're not going to get even half a percent uh, with this technology. And they can look at this and say, all right, well, it's probably not going to really matter. This isn't going to be an important technology. I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, um, this is not a threat to whatever I'm working on. So you can see that it, it's identifying what's really important when we're analysing this technology and trying to see whether, whether it's, it's going to be potentially successful in the future. All right, so let's um, have a few, uh, draw this to a, a bit of a close. So for this analysis, the question was, is it worth investigating LDSC on the front uh, on the new industry standard PERC rear? And I think from this analysis, the answer is yes. Yes, it does have promise. On a pure dollars per watt basis, it doesn't look that convincing. But when we take into account the higher selling price, actually, yeah, this, this could be a winner. But there is some uncertainty in that, and particularly it's about the performance. <coughs> can we get that uh, efficiency gain? Can we achieve that with high yields? Uh, we should focus that on that in the lab. But price premium is, is also impo important. Can we be a bit more certain about what that's going to be? 
And in this case, the individual cost of individual processes, actually, we don't have to worry too much about that. <coughs> That's kind of starting to get into the noise, so we don't have to worry um, that uh, each process is going to be too expensive. Um, so this, I, I'm in the process of <coughs> finishing up this work, excuse me. Um, so there will be more details to come, uh, the paper's in preparation and in that I've also looked at advanced hydrogenation. So you can see that uh, a little bit later. So in summary, what have we done today? We've looked at um, this cost methodology, I've highlighted a few and, and it hopefully explained uh, clearly uh, how it works and, and some of the benefits of this method. And I've shown how it could be applied and how we can get useful, um, useful information uh, for a couple of technologies. So what I want to do just uh, at the end here is say thank you uh, to various people who've helped me uh, along the way for the last couple of years. Um, so my supervisors, uh, Renata and Martin, uh, as well as a number of others, some of you are here, um, who've helped me develop um, this methodology. But not just the methodology, I've uh, been fortunate enough to work with a number of different uh, research groups, both here and uh, at other institutes, in analysing um, some of these different technologies. And just a little advertisement, I guess. <laughs> um, if you've seen this and you're thinking, oh wow, this looks really interesting, I'd really like to, um, to run my, my process uh, through this method. Um, I'm doing this PhD uh, within ACAP and we have some milestones. We actually need to analyse four or five of these technologies each year. And so if you're interested, I'd love to talk to you and I've got my email address there um, if you want to get into contact. Uh, but I'll stop there and open it up for questions. <laughs> yep. Have you done any uh, comparison of production costs in different countries and how it affects your calculations? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, so the question was uh, whether I've analysed for different countries. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in my analysis, I've focused on production uh, assumptions for China because that's where most of the uh, current uh, photovoltaics production is. Um, and certainly this method would be uh, potentially useful for that. So I could very easily um, put different assumptions for, for different parameters and, and put some uncertainty around them and see how important that's going to be. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Yep. Um, Nathan, so one of the common strengths, I suppose, that people talk about with plated contacts is the potential to reduce the cost, the high cost associated with screen printed paste, particularly silver. Um, but I didn't see anywhere in your cost comparisons of B versus D that showed any, any process at all that gave any cost advantage going to D where the pastes were being replaced by the plated contacts. So in this analysis, so so if you were to ignore all the market and efficiency aspects and just look at pure dollars per square metre and see what's the most important, um, then you're going to end up with a lot more of the specific process details uh, and they're going to kind of pop up because you're kind of getting rid of some of the other, um, ignoring some of the other parameters. They do actually turn up here. So... Uh, so the, the cost of the plating solution, the uncertainty in that, and the cost of the front paste um, are on the list, if you like. And um, if you were to look at the, um, the relationship between these costs and the margin, you would see that if we're expecting higher silver costs, uh, for example, then that's going to favour the LDSE technology. And so generally when the... I think that might actually be one of these graphs... Oh no, that's the plating solution. Uh, so I don't have that graph, but if the plating... Yes, yeah, so, so if the um, uh, screen print pastes are particularly expensive, it's going to show an improved margin for D. Yep. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess I was just surprised that you, you had the full list of all the different processes, and I did look at the specific details of each, and you were sort of took out all the ones that were in common between the two, and then yes. he said, and all these other ones, D is always more expensive. And I right. assume one of them would have been replacing the screen printed silver with plated copper, for example. Yes. Um, but it was still showing that as being a more expensive thing to do. Yes. Per square metre. So that's what the analysis 
came, that's what came out of the analysis. Now, there is quite a lot of uncertainty in all this, of course. Um, the uncertainty in the kind of standard processes is, is less because there's more information about them. Uh, but the cost information about some of these alternative processes is a lot more uncertain. And so I've had to put, you know, I've based it on you know, a study done a few years ago, I've had to put wider uncertainty ranges. Um, and, uh, but in the end, uh, it's a matter of priority. So um, certainly it would be possible to go in there and dig deeper and, and try and uh, work out exactly what will be the cost advantage per square metre. Uh, but with, within the bounds of the uncertainty and, and the assumptions in this study, um, they're actually not so important. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Stuart, isn't it the case that the price of screen printed silver has dropped dramatically in the last five years? I suppose it all depends on how much silver you use. I mean, the cost of silver has come back down. It went up and then it's come uh, but back But also down they've changed the formulation, so you've got way less silver in the actual paste. Yeah. So the they're, um, is well, yeah. they're using a lot less paste per yeah. cell. I mean, yes. I, I think that's a big factor. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot so I think on what Nathan's worked with current numbers that have all of those improvements in okay. it, yeah. um, which which have brought the have narrowed that that um, split between the the, the plated sure. and the screen printed yeah. technologies. I, I guess the difference might be you'd, you'd probably redesign the cell if you were using mm. copper plating and you wouldn't have five dust bars. You'd, mm -hmm. you'd go back to having three or something and uh, save yeah. costs there. So yeah. You, yeah, no. yeah. Um, you're comparing PERC with PERC plus LDSE. Do you assume the same cell to module power ratio for the two? And uh, the reason I ask is that, I don't know if this is true, but the LDSE would improve the blue response, but if you whack uh, EVA and glass on top, maybe it doesn't matter because they yeah. absorb the blue anyway. Yeah. No, very good question. So I've been uh, pondering this a little bit <laughs> over the last uh, week or so. Um, so in this particular analysis, the way I've modelled the cell to module conversion is I have assumed that it's equivalent for both, for both cases. So um, when you're converting to, from cell to module, yeah, th there's a lot of innovation happening at the moment, people looking at all these different possibilities uh, and they're going to affect the cost and also the cell to module ratio. So maybe putting on a, an extra coating on the front glass or something, it's going to maybe add this cost, but it improves the cell to module, to, it improves the power ratio. And so in this analysis, I've just assumed that, well, if the cost goes up for one, it's going to go up for the other. If the, if the um, cell to module power ratio goes up, it's also going to go up for the other one. Uh, but you're right, there are potentially, actually the cell to module ratio could be quite different depending on the technology. And um, I am thinking about whether to include that as another parameter. Uh, the other way to think about it is actually here in the, um, the cell efficiency and the cell efficiency boost. So if instead of just saying what will the cell efficiency boost be when you measure it on the cell tester at the end of the cell production line, Okay, you could, you could assume that. But you could also say, well, what's the efficiency boost going to be uh, by the time it kind of reaches full module production? And so if it had a particularly uh, massive gain in blue response, for example, um, then we might say, oh, well, in the lab we've, we've got 1% uh, efficiency boost, but maybe we have to derate that a bit for this analysis and say it's only 0.8, for example. Um, but at the moment anyway, within the uncertainty ranges of those efficiency improvements, um, I think it's kind of a, it's in there in the analysis, but not specifically in that parameter. Oh, sorry, man. Yeah. Oh, you go. Uh, I was just going to ask you about your price premium. Was that number you had there actually cents per watt and not dollars per watt? Like it seemed, sorry, I just, sorry to do that to you. It's very, very, because that's a very small number. So it's point something of a cent per watt. Yes. All right. So what this parameter is, is, okay, so it's per cents per watt. Yeah. So, so normally we say we're going to sell this module at X dollars per watt. Yeah. If we get a higher power module, we're going to get a little bit more dollars per watt. Yeah. So that's what I'm, what I'm trying to measure. How, many, how much are we going to get? in dollars per watt. So that this improvement gets applied to every watt that we produce in the module. But it's also 
per extra watt of module power. So if we've got a, a, a module that is 10 watts higher in power, so then the actual cents per watt uh, selling price improvement would be 10 times this. So for example here, if it's, let's pick 1.12. So, so if, if you've got a 10 watt more, uh, more powerful module, we'd expect 1.2 cents per watt extra selling price. Um, I guess like because there's, that's always been a controversial number and I mean that was a tough number in the back in the SunTech in the Pluto days too as you know and only stuff that Martin's uh, promoted a lot is to just use even like things like the balance of systems costs and all of those types of things to maybe make there be a little less controversy <laughs> to that number you know because it's just uh, basically you've got less area of stuff to handle and you can fairly you know confidently and unambiguously claim um, things through that. That's right so you're right so the value that the market puts on a higher power module is associated with well what's what are you getting you're having you're needing less area to, to do your installation you know fewer frames or whatever it is fewer mounting structures uh, and you could go in there and try and calculate well, what is the actual benefit and how does that translate backwards to the higher power module. Uh, I haven't done that in this case. Uh, what I've done is I've looked at uh, the selling prices for monocrystalline modules compared to multi-crystalline modules and looked at, you know, looked at over a period of time and compared them and uh, used that as um, an estimate for how the market would value a higher power module. That sounds good. Uh, uh, look, it's, a, it, it's very complicated. Yeah, yeah. Out, for example. Like <laughs> it's going to be different in every yeah, type yeah. of application, in every country, yeah, etc. But for example, in China at the moment, there's a lot of applications now that are controlled by the government where unless your module's above a certain efficiency, you cannot even use them. Yeah, right? yeah. And so the premium for getting above a certain efficiency now in China has gone through the roof in terms of the extra value and it makes a lot of the more standard yeah, yeah. Um, product even though it's a lot cheaper to make, mm. you know, the price people can get for the way below. So there's all these distortions to it that really complicated. I don't know how you figure out all that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, this whole discussion is actually uh, kind of really helpful because it's pointing out that this analysis is revealing that this is an important parameter. Yeah, yeah. And then when it reveals it, then you start to think about it and you think, okay, well, what do I actually think is going to happen? And so if, if uh, you're a potential investor or a potential manufacturer of this technology and you say, oh, well, I'm, I'm sure that um, higher power modules are going to be uh, much more valuable in the market. <coughs> I'm sure of that. And then it's going to influence your decision. You're going to, you know, this analysis is going to say, oh, well, actually, maybe it's, th that's more of a reason. I mean, still, you need to show that it's going to work, of course. But, um, but if it, you know, it, it gives more, more of a reason to, to invest in it. Uh, and conversely, yeah, if, if, you, if you think, oh, look, people aren't going to care about that anymore in the future, um, all they care is about dollars per watt, then it will influence your decision as well. But it's, it's um, revealed, I guess, its importance. And I think what Stu talks about is where people have really made money from it. Like where the difference is, is if you've got, say, 20%, you're lower 20% of your production, if you only get half as much for that, and you change that lower 20% to a lower 10%, like if you do the numbers on that you've you've done something like trebled your profit or something <laughs> like that like so so it's, it's that sort of cliff like behavior where I think people have really um, sank and floated companies <laughs> on as opposed to a sliding so that's even more complicated again to mm -hmm. model because that changes all the time yes, yeah, yeah. One more questions <laughs> You had your overlapping costs and the overlapping uncertainty, and there's quite a strong overlap. And I'm just wondering, does that actually mean that it's it's difficult to actually statistically say that one's better than the other? So, for example, something like this. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, if we were doing this analysis uh, completely independently, so we generated one distribution for B, and just said, um, let's calculate B and then we got an answer. It would look like the blue curve. And then we stopped that and we went and built another model and we, uh, we analysed D. Mm -hmm. We get another curve and we pop that on top. It would look like that. So 
the uncertainty is basically the same uncertainty sort of thing for each one in a sense. But that's right, because there's common uncertainty underneath, when we look at the difference, because we're doing it, the sa so if we, if we did do the analysis completely separately, we didn't do the simultaneous Monte Carlo analysis, and then we did the subtraction thing, it just, it wouldn't help. You'd end up with these overlapping curves. But because we're doing them at the same time, and there's common causes of variation in both cases, when we do the subtraction, a lot of those cancel out. Well, not exactly cancel out, but they, uh, yeah, because it's more complicated than that. But um, that effect is, that noise is removed. Uh, in some sense, and we can see more clearly what's happening. So, so the, the only other thing I was going to ask was, um, you've done sort of going from aluminium, you know, BSF to you know, um, the full deal, right? And people go, oh, will I go to that? Now, if, if, if you're going to upgrade a line, that's a big decision. But if you're going to say, look, I'm putting in five more new lines, if I decide oh, I'll just put in the, the standard one and then five years later find out I've made the wrong decision, um, so you might want to hedge your bets and go, well, look, I'll put in a, a fully kitted out line and then just get to turn off those bits. Have you looked at the sort of cost, cost differential of that? Like, how much more does it cost to run an aluminium BSF through a, through a, a, you know, a full-on yeah, LBSC yeah, right. line? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that sort of thing. Because uh, yeah. that, that, if yeah. you're at that point where you're buying a whole new line, mm. you may want to you know, future-proof yourself or something. So the analysis, the analysis is actually, in both cases, assumes you're building a new line. So, so it's not actually saying, um, yeah, let's invest in a, in a change as such. Um, so yeah, that particular analysis would be a little bit different. Um, presumably you get very similar kinds of answers, but um, there might be some complications. Um, I guess you've got a sunk cost anyway. That we'd have to think about that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something I, I don't know how you cost it, but I mean, if, if I was investing in new technology, like if you've got two technology and one's sort of fairly standard and another one's got, you know, very quite innovatively different. Um, I mean, investing in a technology that most people are doing something similar to that, you know that you're going to get dragged along with the momentum of what everybody else is doing at virtually no ongoing investment costs. It's a real moving target, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're trying, and this is part of the troubles that SunTech had in trying to do Pluto as a somewhat different type of technology, but still trying to compete with, you know, the rest of the world that were all doing standard screen printing that was improving at a more rapid rate mm -hmm. and narrowing the performance difference, right? So, you know, if you're going to invest in a new line, um, that must be an important consideration, but I don't know how you factor that into it. So I haven't... Um it's not directly in the model. So that, that would be the kind of thing that you would, I guess, add on to this analysis. So you, you do the... Gut feeling. Well, uh, gut feeling. I mean, it, it, additional analysis perhaps, maybe not. Or are there an uncertainty on something like your efficiency or your yield, or there's some way that you could, you could capture that, that gut feel in the numbers somewhere? Well, what, what about the technology development? <laughs> you know, like, like copper, if you're doing copper plating and you're one of two or three manufacturers doing it, in the meantime, you know, DuPont and Horaeus are dropping loads of money on making silver paste better. You know, you got that, that sort of uh, differential in technology development potential as well. If you're a, uh, a leading player who's sort of doing something that everyone else is. So there is a, a, little bit, bit of, a little bit of that has actually come into this analysis in that the costs for the standard processes was taken from you know, fairly up-to-date data. Uh, whereas the cost of the LDSC specific processes was based on a study a few years ago. It's actually a UNSW study. And in that I've actually had to work, you know, estimate with an uncertainty, how have the costs of the, these other processes changed? And in the end, uh, when I compare how much the standard processes have changed, and I looked at um, uh, how much the uh, LDSC specific processes changed, I actually derated them a little bit, if that makes sense. So I didn't bring them down as much. And that's partially a reflection of that these haven't been what people have invested in. So the manufacturers aren't there with economies of scale to have you know, very cheap equipment. So which would be contributing to your earlier question about why LDSC, uh, even on a per square metre basis, is also a little bit more expensive. Okay, so um, thank you, Nathan. I'd, um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to finish on uh, one point, and that is that we're working with Michael Woodhouse, who's probably, at NREL, he's probably the world's best in techno-economic analysis. And his focus has been on 
costing the current technologies and looking at, at competitiveness uh, and with particularly with a US perspective. Um, Michael's really interested in what we're doing here with the uncertainty analysis because he'd like to add that to what he's doing. Uh, and then what we plan to do is to take that f look further, look, broaden the scope so we're looking more at balance of systems costs and different markets as well for the different technologies beyond flat plate crystalline silicon in a field or on a roof. Uh, and then we also want to go and look forward into the future and try to add some of this understanding around uncertainties to try and predict future pricing. So that will help with fut when we you know, develop it. We're looking at a new technology development and saying it'll come to market in five years' time. We need to price it against silicon in five years' time rather than silicon now. So there's, uh, you know, the scope for doing interesting things with these models and this analysis is huge. So anybody with any wants anything um, uh, assessed or to take any of the conversations that have come today, we can, we'll be interested in looking at following up a bunch of those. So on the back of that, um, I'd just like to all, all of you to join me in thanking Nathan. For the <laughs>